Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you joined us. You can always find us at goodlifetelevision.org, uh, where we have all the interviews, some amazing people, um, and so many of you have joined us there from all over the world. We, we have the full interviews, and then we also have what we call power clips, so you can see some of the great moments from those interviews. We'd love to have you join us there. Um, and as always, this program is brought to you by the Turner Foundation. Uh, you can go to theturnerfoundation.com, which is, and you can read what we're all about. But we're, we're so delighted you're with us. I'm so excited about my guest today. Hannah Joya is with me. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. There's a great book called Never Goodbye that Hannah's written about her journey uh, with her father and her journey in life, which I've, I've started over the last few days, and it's really wonderful. So I'd encourage you to, to pick it up. Um, but start by just kind of talking a little bit about your life, kind of growing up and, and growing up with your dad, and, and yeah. then we can kind of get to the book. Yeah, so I was born into a father who was paralyzed. So the only vision I ever had of my dad was being in the wheelchair. So for me, that was normal. And that was the best type of father I could have ever asked for. Um, as a little girl, my dad was my best friend. Um, I'd always call him Iron Man because he was always one to get out of everything, uh, my superhero. Um, and we just had such an amazing, special, unique relationship, my father and I. Um, I know there were so many times where I had soccer games and my dad would be just wheeling himself to the soccer games. And to me, that was just the most incredible eyesight I could have ever had but to other people they're like is she okay like oh my gosh like condolences I'm like what's wrong with them I'm like eight years old right. um, but it was just it's just such a special way how God was able to use that situation and make it so meaningful for me um, so I would have never asked for anything different in the father and he so just so that everyone just to clarify so he suffered it's a long name but yeah. Guillain Barr syndrome. I might butcher the name myself. It's, it, it's long. It's long. So it's Guillain Barre syndrome. So GBS. Okay. And CIDP, which I'm not going to say because I will just butcher it. Butcher okay. it. But it's they, CIDP. They can look that up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was so it's a chronic and progressive mm -hmm. condition where the body essentially attacks itself over time. Exactly. So, so, so he dealt with this for decades. Right? Twenty-seven years. Twenty-seven years. Exactly. Your entire life. My entire life. Mm -hmm. So you you're on this journey with him. And your mom and your siblings, where you're literally having to watch him just get yeah. worse, right? Exactly. I mean, is yeah. that kind of what it was like? It was, yes. Um, so he was able to live at home for a long time. So for, I would say, 20 years, he was able to be at the house. So between my mom, myself, and my older brother, we were all his caretakers. So, I, and when I say caretaker, I mean like caretaker. Like we would have to scratch his hand for him. We would have, my mom would brush his hair. Um, just everything that we take for granted, sometimes the simplest of things, uh, we had to be there for him. So neck down, completely paralyzed. But yeah, he was able to have a normal, normal life, living at home for 20 years, but mentally he was there, all there. He was able to speak, he was able to communicate, um, but physically he wasn't. And I would say the last seven years was when things just went downhill. Um, he was placed on a life support. Uh, the final three years of his life, um, wow. or I'm sorry, final six years of his life, living wow. at the nursing facility. Yeah, so that was, I would say, the most challenging, challenging years. Wow. Yeah. In this book, you, you, you talk about your this journey you had with your dad. It's funny, it's insightful, it's warm. Mm -hmm. I really, I love it. You have a great no. <laughs> writing style. But, Thank you. But you, you kind of distilled, and I wanted to kind of go through some of these, because it, it seems like... Uh, what happened to you was that God mm -hmm. used what was a really rough thing mm -hmm. and you've taken some amazing uh, lessons and you've you've written them and so I was going to just kind of ask you about some of the principles and kind of some of what you've learned just for you to share yeah. a little bit about um, one of them is embracing joy in the unknown love that one talk about yes. that Embracing joy in the unknown. So our entire journey was unknown. There was so much mystery. There was so much not knowing. Um, and I would be lying if I said that there weren't moments where we were hopeless, where we were joyless. Um, but I would say that embracing joy in the unknown, to me what that meant personally, was just not even having to ask God the facts or the whys or having to figure out the meaning behind so many of the, the questions and prayers that I had. But it was just embracing 
the simplest simplicity of joy. And what I mean by that is we had the opportunity of just being there for families who had no one at the hospitals and nursing homes. And there were so many moments where I'm like, God, why can't you just have my dad get better like them? Or why can't you have him walk? Like why? But putting that to the side and looking at the bigger picture, there are other families here that don't have someone. So embracing that by being there for them, mm. using something that was supposed to break us, how the enemy was using that to just defeat us. Right. My mom, myself, and my brother like, you know what? We are going to be the only Jesus these families are mm. ever gonna see. And that to us was how we embrace joy in the unknown. Wow. Wow, uh, that, that's an interesting thought to, because we do, I think it is natural to ask why, why? For, for a long time, why, you know, and we've, we've been through stuff where, you know, that, that you want to know. Exactly. But it seems like in your guy's case, you're able to kind of, at some point, set that aside and say, okay, maybe it doesn't matter why. Here's yeah. where we are, mm -hmm. and here's... How, what are we going to do? And I was listening to your mom talk about the fact you guys have done ministry now mm -hmm. in nursing homes. Exactly, and yes. I, I mean, imagine the power of the fact that you were there mm -hmm. and then that got to be born out of the situation that maybe that's the why. I mean, you know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. And we would have never been able, my mom actually had a ministry just between our family called the Good Night. <laughs> so it's nothing crazy, but it was just called Good Night. So as we were leaving the nursing home where my dad was staying, the, the ones who didn't have family members, my mom would go to each room and just kind of peek through and see if like they maybe needed something to be tucked in or a blanket to pull, like, be pulled up. And she would just simply say goodnight and allow them to feel seen wow. and loved. And that's just the reason, our why, like what you said, that's our why. That's yeah. why we were there because God specifically anointed that time for us to be there, yeah. to just be the only Jesus and hope for them, for them right. to see. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Uh, resilience is contagious. We yeah. talked about that. Yes, Talk so about contagious. Resilience a little bit. My dad was quite contagious. He was contagious because the man had resilience. And there were times where I was just walking out of the hospital or the urgent care and just like defeated, just so upset to, to the situation, not knowing where this was going to lead us to. Um, and there was my dad. My dad just in the wheelchair with a trach in his throat, not being able to breathe, only through a ventilator. And there he was turning, having the nurse turn the knob to a speaking valve and telling me that God was good. And I'm, what? Like, come on, like this guy is contagious because his resilience, he didn't need to teach me what life was about. He didn't need to teach me what the definition of resilience was. He showed me every single day what that was. And I think that was the biggest thing for me as a daughter was to see my dad sacrifice every single day to just to be there by walking by faith, not physically, but showing me what resilience and walking by faith was. That's so beautiful. Your dad, he was fond of saying God is good. <laughs> Love that saying. Loved I, it. I mean, that, that and it, with what he was dealing with, yeah. to have that perspective, to have the truth, to have that truth mm -hmm. is so powerful. And his actual text message, the last one he sent me, was God is good. His last text message. Is Six days right? before he passed. It was. Oh. It was God is good. Count your blessings. Jesus loves you. Proud of you. Love you. And again, God is good. So he's just like... You know, when I see him in heaven, I'll be like, Dad, God is good, running through the gates. It's just amazing. Just amazing. When we are weak, God is strong. Mm -hmm. Another great one. When we are weak, God is strong. Because there, we were, there were so many, so many nights where as joyful and hopeful and resilient my father was, um, he had his doubts, of course. He had his ordinary Wednesday afternoon, laying in the bed, looking at the ceiling, fighting that mental battle. And he's human. We're all human. And I love the fact how God says in the word that when we are weak, he is strong. And my father was so weak. I mean, to the world, he was the weakest of the weak. To the mm -hmm. doctors, he had no, no hopeful prognosis. There was no going up from here. And he was considered to be at the lowest, at the lowest. And I love how God says that when we are weak, he is strong because it was through my dad's weakness, through our weakness, through our doubts and questions, God's strength was completely shining through all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, a lot of the doctors would say. They were saying, you know, it's not looking good for you, sir. It's not looking good. You got pneumonia on two lungs. 
but yet my dad was still there smiling, asking how they were. And that's, that's right there how God was able to use his weakness to yeah. show his strength. That's only God. That yeah. is only God able to do that through so us. So amazing. You, you, talked about, you, talk, you talk about remembering God's love for you, mm-hmm. which, and, and of course, you know, you have a dad who's in this really difficult mm-hmm. situation. He's looking at you and telling you God is good. Um, but, but remembering God's love for you in, mm-hmm. in, in, in moments, because like you talk about, the average Wednesday afternoon where it's just like, mm-hmm. here we go, you know, talk about that and what you learned about God's love in this process. Yeah, gosh. I mean, that was the only way I was able to get through all of this was through God's love. And there were, growing up as in my 20s, in my teens, um, I've always wanted to just be accepted by people. I've always wanted to feel like they were there for me. I wanted them to ask me, how's your dad doing? Like, is there anything they can do for us? Um, Always basing my love on other people's love and acceptance towards us. But I think really how I felt God's love throughout this whole journey was just putting my trust in Him. Mm -hmm. Just completely putting my trust in Him. And just staying focused, staying present, staying groundful to know that I may never know my unanswered prayers or the wise on this side of eternity. Mm -hmm. But just knowing that when I do see God face to face, that He will say it all. That, that he'll tell me, he'll say, Hannah, like, I loved you and I saw you, I was there for you. And it was just through like the Holy Spirit, God's love that I felt his comfort mm. in the moments where I thought it was my dad's final breaths. It, it was God's love where he was there at the last moments before my dad took his final, his final breath and when his heart went flat. There was nothing else in this world that could have ever comforted me, but it was just a, an overflow of God's love. There's no words to describe it, but that's just how I know yeah. in my moments of doubts, there is a God. There is yeah. a God who loves me and there's so much purpose behind the pain. Yeah. Setbacks becoming comebacks. Yes. Talk about that. Yeah, you're holding it right there, the book. That to me <laughs> right. is my comeback. <laughs> no. Right. But it's just, it's so true. I thought I was 20, 27 when my father passed away. So two and a half years ago, and I'm telling you, Dean, I thought that was the end. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought that was it. There was no, not going to get emotional, no emotions here. But if it does come out, it's, it's just okay. because I truly thought that was my, my setback. I thought that was it. And it was just so true how God comes through and mm. like how God is so close to the brokenhearted. Mm. And he was so close to me. And day after day, I wrote and wrote, and this was just the comeback to know that our story, our faith is going to help people who feel like there's no hope for them. Mm -hmm. And it's not about telling my father's story or telling about my journey. It's about showing how a girl who had so much setbacks, how a man who had so much setbacks was to be able to show God's comeback. And there's a tear. And that's just truly what I believe, how God is able to shine the brightest. And, you know, it's, it's so much about the journey. It is. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we were so, I think, I feel like in life and in this world, we can be pretty destination oriented mm-hmm. and not journey oriented, you know, because exactly. it's just an average Wednesday and I'm staring at the ceiling and nothing's changing. God, mm-hmm. you know, what's, and then exactly. to think about the journey, what's going on, mm-hmm. like what's actually happening inside of you and your mom and your... Like, exactly. that's a beautiful thing that mm-hmm. it seems like when, when I was reading this, I was thinking about the fact that you guys have been on a journey mm-hmm. and the journey, you know, is more important than the destination. Exactly. You know? It's so true. And that's actually how I came up with the title, Never Goodbye. Yeah. Because I was like, oh my goodness, God. I mean, there is a reason why I feel like a lot of people are just never content in life. Like there's just so much... There's that something that a lot of people, unbelievers, believers say that there's just never, there's never that fulfillment. And I truly believe wholeheartedly that God created us to be like that because we weren't meant to spend eternity on earth. Right. We're, it's never goodbye because home is our heaven. Like heaven is where we're destined. It's paradise. 
And that's the only comfort of God's love that I felt helped me with my grief was knowing that, no, this is not goodbye. Yeah. Like, this is never goodbye. I am going to see my dad. I'm going to see the, the, the ones that we tucked in at night at the nursing home again. We are going to have the biggest reunion yeah. ever. That's so good. And it's so, I'm so, well, it's going to be epic. It's funny you say that, and I love the title <laughs> because it's, we have a brain injured daughter who's taught us this. Mm. She, she, she literally, she doesn't like goodbyes. Yeah. And so it was annoying for me for a while because like we'd be at the restaurant and the waiter would say goodbye and she'd like start to melt down and we're like, oh, and yeah. then I started to think about it. I go, like, she's right. You know, for the believer, mm -hmm. and C.S. Lewis said this, my, my daughter was right with C.S. Lewis, right, right, <laughs> at that, right, right at that, in that stratosphere of there are no goodbyes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There are no goodbyes. And, and so now we've just started to go with it. We, yeah. we stopped correcting her. We said, okay, fine, fine. There's no goodbyes. So uh, see you later. Yeah. See you soon. See you, see soon. you later. Hasta luego. See ya. Hasta la vega. <laughs> Transforming tests to testimonies. Th th this mm -hmm. is a testimony. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you all went through a 27 year test. Mm -hmm. Talk about that for someone right now who's in their test. Mm -hmm. Someone who's right now struggling with whether it's a debilitating disease, a family mm -hmm. member, uh, somebody's struggling, something's happening. T speak to, after the journey you've been on, mm -hmm. speak to that person who's in the test right now who maybe doesn't think it's possible. Like, they're mm -hmm. in that spot where they're going, they're nothing going good can come from this. Nothing. Yeah, I would first give them a hug <laughs> from six feet, a virtual hug. And then I would just look them in the face with the, with the understanding, I get it, heart, that there will come a time where God will use your pain for so much more purpose. And when we were going through our tests, um, a lot of things people were saying to me just kind of went through the left and right ear. A lot of verses were being said, but at the moment when you're going through so much pain, when you're going through so much loss, you don't really hear it. You, you don't really hear it. So what I would encourage and comfort the ones who are going through tests to know that you are so seen and you have so much purpose and love and that there is a God who will be with you when you may not feel like it mm -hmm. and to just keep walking forward to keep putting one foot in front of the other and knowing that at the end of this life when you walk through those heaven gates God's going to look at you and say well done my good and faithful servant mm -hmm. and just keep hoping for that putting all the the questions to the side and just keeping your eyes focused keep praying crying being real with your pain I mm -hmm. believe being so real is the pathway to healing because God wants to know your emotions. I mean, there were moments where I was in San Diego on the beach, just like crying out. Like there was nothing joyful coming out, but it was just anger and sadness. And I would just, I would say to just keep, keep praying to God, keep being real with him. Mm. He mm -hmm. can handle our emotions. He can handle it. That's, the man can handle a, it. Yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> um, and yet, and one of the things you said in here, which I thought was interesting was, Trust God, not your emotions. So emotions are good and part of being human, mm -hmm. but you make a distinction there between putting your trust in God mm -hmm. and not your emotions. Talk a little bit about that. Gosh, emotions are so fleeting. My dad actually included that in his last text message to trust God, not your emotions. Hmm. And that's actually like my thing that I've held so close to because I mean, one day I could feel like on top of the world and then the next day I feel like I just want to eat a bowl of ice cream and just watch friends. Like there's just, emotions are just so up and down. And my dad was a true testament of not trusting his emotions because if he did, if he trusted his emotions, if he trusted the reality of his situation, he would be in a psych ward. He would be depressed in a psych ward. Yeah. But my dad was so firm in his belief about trusting God and it was contagious. It, it flowed through me. It, it, it really... I caught, I caught his illness of being so trustworthy towards God. And it's just putting your emotions to the side. And emotions are, I mean, half the time they're not even true. Um, but just trusting on the one who is true, and, and that's Jesus Christ. When he passed, mm -hmm. you made a promise mm -hmm. that, that you wanted to tell this story. You wanted to, and the, which became this book. Mm -hmm. Talk about now kind of what your vision is for helping to bring hope, helping to bring the principles, which all these principles are good. Uh, mm. I'll, I'll say, I mean, it's amazing what you've learned at a really young age. Oh, thank you. Um, 
But talk about your vision for, for now going forward and how you want to mm -hmm. bring light. Yeah, so this book is my dad's promise. I promised my dad. Um, I remember the doctors coming in saying that his time was, was coming in the next few minutes. And that photo actually is the last moment my dad and I held hands together. And I promised him that I would never let his faith go untold. And this book is a true testament of that. I promised him that what he went through, what we went through as a family, is never going to be forgotten because it's not our story, it's God's story. Mm -hmm. And my hope and my vision for this book, to me, what I consider a New York's best time seller is if someone messages me or if I get that email saying, hey, I was going through a tough time and this inspired me mm -hmm. or this encouraged me, that to me is done. Like I can wrap up my stuff, right. go to Hawaii, One call it quits, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. But I truly feel my dad and God just as I pray every night, I really feel like what they're trying to speak to me now is like it's time to get to work. I mean. Time is so limited on earth and with everything going on in the world, I feel like God and my dad are just speaking to me like, let's get to work. Let's start pointing people to God. Let's bring hope. Let's not preach to them, but let's just love on them. And yeah. that truly is my vision for this book is just that opportunity to, to converse with them, to let them know that this is not goodbye. This is not the end. Yeah. This life that we're living in is just the beginning. We have so much to hope for. So it's more of a let's get things done. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it fires me up. Fire I, I, you I up. really love it. I, I, I feel like so many people right now are are on this sheet of music. What you just mm -hmm. said about let's go, you let's know. Go. Um, it, I had a mentor one time who, who, who said he was a young pastor and he was he, he was struggling mm -hmm. as a young pastor, and he said one time God kind of spoke to him and said. Stop telling them what to do and start telling them who I am. Wow, that's good right there, Dean. And I thought, you know, this is a moment, the whole world, I mean, here we are, we're just, what's next? You know, the mosquito hornet's coming. <laughs> where are we? What's happening? You know, God knows. Who knows? Who knows? But I think so many people are going, you know, tell me the truth. You know, tell me, yeah. who is this? And it just seems like this is a moment. You know, some people call it a Kairos mm -hmm. moment where it's like the moment in time where it's, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I feel like that's where we are, yeah. you know, where people want to know and, and people are struggling and people yeah. are mm -hmm. suicide and dis despair, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and this is just such a light. And my previous guest is the same thing, just the stories that you've been through mm -hmm when you've been through it and you can tell a true story that I went through it. It didn't end. It didn't even end the way you wanted it to, mm -hmm. you know, it didn't even uh, here, exactly. but yet you have this light mm -hmm. and you have this joy that, that I just feel like mm -hmm. lots of people need to hear about this. Yeah. I guess that's why we're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> Good life TV. Yeah. Love it. Good life Gotta TV. Gotta love it. Yeah. yeah. No, but yeah, you nailed it. Everything was tweetable, what you just said. I would tweet everything <laughs> right tweet. now. Good. That's good. That's <laughs> Hashtag. Yeah. Hashtag it all. Um, I, I want to, before we close, I want yeah. you to talk a little bit about your relationship with your dad. Mm -hmm. um, just walk us through some of the kind of the tender moments. It seems like mm -hmm. he was an amazing person. Yeah. Um, who's now healed fully healed mm -hmm. so that was granted and he's more healed than we can possibly imagine yeah. but share a little bit of just about uh, about him gosh that man the man was my partner in crime let's see he was fast he was really fast in his wheels <laughs> i was will say he? that he was he was the speedy wheels i have a chapter called speedy wheels because he was quite the fast one in that electric wheelchair but man there were so many funny stories with my dad um Gosh. And humor was a big part of humor. it. Humor. He it? was so funny. Like, he was so funny. I don't know why. Like, okay, I guess I will tell this one story at the hospital or at the nursing home. Um, he had moments where he was able to get off the vent and just kind of hang out in the lobby. About three to five hours, he had the freedom to do whatever he pleased. So, there was a hotel right in front of the nursing home. So, I was like, Dad, why don't we just, why don't we go get some fresh air? Why don't we just go walk out or wheel out? Let's roll out, Dad. Like, we would always have <laughs> these little slings. Let's roll out. And then... We would just roll out and he would come and we would love to sit in the lobby of this hotel in front of the nursing facility and there was free breakfast and free dinner a lot oh, of the really? times at the, at the hotel. So I was good friends with the front desk receptionist. She knew who we were. She knew my father. She knew where he was at. 
So whenever we came in, she was so open to us having cereal or oatmeal or tea or coffee, but my dad was not having it. He was so embarrassed how I would be the type to grab free things. <laughs> I'm like, dad, come on, look extra sick today. I need something, I'm hungry. <laughs> but no, I guess the one funny moment was when he was so hungry and he wanted me to grab some fruit roll-ups. So I was like, okay, I got you, dad, I got you. So as we were going, he saw a couple like tourists just walking around. I grabbed some fruit roll-ups and he like pretended he didn't know me. <laughs> he pretended he didn't know me. I was like, dad, how many do you want? He just like wheeled himself and just left. And here I am. I think they thought it was like a little, little loose up there and we just bolted and I knew exactly what was happening. So just the humor the guy really had was just humor, humor, humor. He had it all. I, I look forward to meeting him. Yeah, I know. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, again, the book is Never Goodbye. Uh, Hannah Joya, you can connect with her on Facebook. That Hannah Joya, Instagram, Hannah Marie Joya. Uh, but I, I'd encourage you to, to read about this journey because it's not just about the journey. It's, it is really, I think, um, even as much so about these principles and what she's learned. It, there's a lot of great stuff. So. Congratulations. Thanks, Steve, for having me. Thank you for coming. It's great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. We'll see you next time. This is Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. What is Good Life TV, you may ask? Well, let me tell you. Good Life TV exists to inspire, empower, educate, and encourage. Those are the things we want to do in a rough year that we're having. We want to encourage you. We want to inspire you. We're telling stories. They're real life stories. They're not all celebrities. They're people from all walks of life. And I think you're really going to be encouraged. There's a bunch of them at goodlifetelevision.org. So go there today, goodlifetelevision.org. Get encouraged. We love you. God bless you. Welcome to Good Life, I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you joined us today. Uh, I have a special guest today, Dave O'Dell is with me. Dave is a friend, he is a business executive, entrepreneur, also an athletic director here in Santa Barbara, California at Westmont College. So he's an interesting, amazing guy. Dave, welcome. Thank you. Thank so you, first Dean. of all, I'll, I'll say, so Dave's dad, Bill, was the head basketball coach at Azusa Pacific University for 16 years. Coached for 39 years total. At six, in his 16 years at Azusa Pacific, I think his winning percentage was 804 or something, something really high. Um, so I want to start by apologizing <laughs> because I heckled Bill a fair amount <laughs> as a Westmont student. <laughs> I mean, like a lot. So if you, if Bill, if you're watching, I'm sorry. <laughs> and on behalf of all Westmont students, you know, the sit down Bill chant. <laughs> So I just want to clear the air. That's I've, been, good. I've been having that on my shoulders for a while. Yeah, time. as the Westmont Athletic Director, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh. That wasn't the worst of our chants, actually. <laughs> like back in the day, like some of our chants were a little. Yeah, uh, you couldn't get away with that. Couldn't now. do that now. No, yeah. no, we would have had to kick you out. <laughs> right, right. I probably would have got tossed a few times. Um, yeah. So Bill O'Dell's an amazing guy himself, and I actually wanted to start with that. Hmm. Tell me about your father-son relationship with your dad. Yeah. Well, first off. Um, just unconditional love yeah um, and uh, that's that was the foundation for our relationship and that I never doubted that for a moment mm -hmm. and uh, he's a he's an amazing human in that he is very very consistent um, he didn't have a ton of words but when he spoke them uh, they impact they were impactful mm. and uh, and then um, you know the greatest blessing really in my life is that I got to stand and sit by his side from the time I was five years old to the time I left for Westmont mm. uh, and uh, I sat at the end of every bench for almost every game is that since right? I was five years old I uh, got to be essentially teammates with different set of guys every year in Long Beach and wow. uh, learned a ton from that experience um, about life and you know about growing up in a very very diverse uh, area of Long Beach mm -hmm. and different um, you know lifestyles and different uh, you know ways 
people lived and um, and got to be there. Got to ride the bus with the team. Wow. Uh, got to sit in at the halftime talks um, for really you know 13 years. Wow. Um, and so that uh, it had has been so formative. Was so formative. For oh, me. I bet. Yeah. Was he at Millican? Long Beach Millican, yes. So he was there for like 20 years. Yes. Yes. Okay. So when you were. Uh, yeah. And then he and then after you left for Westmont, then yeah. he ended up going to Azusa. Right. Right. He okay. I think 90. I was at Westmont. He was never at Westmont while I was at West. I mean, never at Azusa while I was at Westmont. OK. I think 91 was his first year at Azusa. I graduated okay. Westmont in 89. OK. OK. So I can remember I played my very last game at Westmont. We lost in the district uh, tournament and got a ride from from an old friend, Garrett O'Hara, from our game, our Westmont game, to the LA Sports Arena to watch my dad win the CF championship. Is that right? Yeah, so wow. that was a special. Did he night. have a preference? Did he, what did he like? I mean, I'm sure it's a hard question to answer, but did, was a high school coaching experience for him versus the, the college coaching experience? Did he have a preference in terms of the 20 years and? High school or at Milken versus the 16 years. Yeah, of the I think it was. You know, he 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 and my mom treated that as their ministry, and you know, really serving uh, youth. And so, um, obviously, Milliken being a public school was very different in that. You know, what what you could do, and then you go to Azusa at this Christian right. school, and it was very. You know, you could could be very upfront about right. things and talk right. about things that way. So it was very different. Very different, yeah. and I would say, um, you know, he has great relationships with with athletes that he coached at both places. In fact, he just went to last year had a big gathering of a group of guys from the 70s at Milliken and they met at a Laker game in a box and uh, it was really? just one of those things that when you're a retired coach it was such a blessing Doesn't for him. Doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So but the yeah. Zusa the Zusa relationships because you get 4 years with them right. and you recruited them and all that those right. those relationships are more sort of you know lifelong and more day to day like relationships yeah. that he still has. That makes sense. So and we were talking before we came on about Jeff Rudder, one of your dad's uh, old assistants, who yes. I know he's dear friends with. He was one of my high school uh, teammates and good friends. Um, so he was the athletic director at Azusa Pacific as well as the head coach. And for then, a time, yes. For a time. Yeah. And then and then you be, you became the athletic director at Westmont. Correct. And uh, as I was reading for this interview, I was kind of looking at his story and yours. His track record as a... AD in terms of the whatever the award is for the GSAC, GSAC all sports all yeah. sports and then yours <laughs> which is no slouch um, I think eight eight years in a row or something is what I read that that in, that you've won that award as AD yes and I can't believe it's already been 11 years since you've been AD yeah it's that's gone by quick very quick yeah, yeah. but so tell me about so y your dad coach AD you were a player, yeah. you're a businessman, and we'll get to that in a minute, but tell me about what it's been like to be the athletic director at Westmont College, and also, what is your vision for the student athlete right. there? Right, that's a great, great question. So, so first, interesting, quick story. So the reason I decided to do the AD thing is because I thought it was gonna be a cool way to hang out with my dad, because he was still the AD at Azusa. Oh, okay. And so the first three years, or two or three years I was AD, he was still AD at APU. Okay. In fact, that, that award, the All Sports Award, has been in our family for something like 20 years, <laughs> because he had it, and <laughs> the amazing. first year he was gone, we won it. And so, That's anyway, amazing. so yeah, so we, we laugh about that. That's so someday fantastic. somebody will get it from us. Is there us. a trophy? Yeah, it's a, there's a, the it's a really cool The just own that trophy. Yeah, it's, I love it's, it. it goes That's to really each school. And it's wow. funny because it has Azusa, 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 Azusa. And then it says Westmont, 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 Westmont. Wow. It's pretty cool. That is awesome. So anyway, so we had a blast um, being in these business meetings, you know, right. for the conference together. Right. And, uh, and he taught me so much just to do that job. And, yeah. uh, and so I was always able to bounce. And then when he retired, it was even better because I could bounce a lot of things off of him. Oh, right. right. Yeah, our, our vision for athletes at Westmont is that they have a life-changing experience through athletics. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and we believe that, you know, the, the, 
all the pillars of Westmont that, you know, this, this liberal arts education where you've got to do all that and there's no free ride for athletes at Westmont right. <laughs> as it relates right. to academics and you got to play a sport at a really high level and practice and that time commitment right. and you got to, you got to spend time to nurture your faith and all the things that Westmont brings in that regard. Right. And, and so we, we see sort of the final product after four years as this super well-rounded person that's had some, had some challenges, had some adversity, mm -hmm. had to dig in and do a lot of things well. Right. Um, and, uh, and we think that that, that experience really has an, has an impact on them and you and you know that as much as anybody uh, yeah well it was a great experience for me i was not a good baseball player and it took up a lot of time so i retired <laughs> <laughs> but it was but the westmont experience is phenomenal for people that don't know or are watching this somewhere else westmont college is a private christian college in the hills of santa barbara california 1200 or so students with an outstanding everything in my opinion um, and I'm not just saying that because Gail Beebe is going to be here in a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. I mean it. It's an outstanding. And our family has been blessed by Westmont a lot. But you've won a lot. It's interesting in that answer, winning didn't come up. And I know you, you want to win. Mm -hmm. But the other stuff is more important. And so how have you managed to win so much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, we, we think that winning is, is a great metric for how we're doing. Um, if we're doing things well, we're gonna win games. Um, one of the first things I did being a business guy is I, I created this giant spreadsheet and I, I wanted to see what our win losses were as an entire program, all sports. And uh, when I became AD, we'd won 41% of our contests the previous year. Um, and uh, we started instituting some changes, a wide range, range of changes. And, uh, like what? Uh, well, we did a number of things. We, well, you know, initially there were some coaching changes right, um, right away. Right. Um, we, uh, we instituted um, a captain's retreat that, um, where we sort of poured into the captains and helped them, mm. you know, do that job well. Right. Um, Great idea. Uh, so that was important. We, we started a tradition of an all athlete meeting uh, where we pulled all the athletes together. Um, every year we pick a, a verse of the year um, mm. and a theme for the year around that we want the whole program to adopt um, as, as all 250 athletes, not just team by team. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, uh, and we really talked a lot about each team supporting other teams. So we came up like with brother sister teams. Hmm. Um, we did some things like that, and and we got um, we got each team cheering for each other yeah. and feeling like part of something bigger than just their twelve guys on a basketball floor or thirty guys on a baseball field. Right. Um, that they actually had could have an impact on how the school did in total, and so. I, I told my coaches, I said, I don't care where the wins come from. They can come from women's soccer, men's basketball. I just want wins. And so if, if, if your program is going to get wins, that's, you know, that's showing me that the metric is right. And if you're doing it in the right way, of course. Right. right. So uh, that first year we won 41 percent. Uh, the, the first year we won, like we we're right at where we were before. It was a rough first year. And then it just started creeping up. And uh, so now it's interesting because we're always flirting around 75%. Really? Yeah. And the last probably three, four years, we've been in the 75% range across all sports. Um, obviously, That's you can't amazing. take into account track cross country because they don't do head to head right, right. stuff. But, but you're uh, pretty good in track. Uh, yeah. But those track? are good too. So yeah, Russell Smelly. Yeah. 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 So, wow. Uh, so anyway, so that, that kind of focus on the full program versus these little siloed things. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah. I think so you kind of viewed it as a, as one collective program, yeah. not individual teams. Correct. That's really yeah. smart. I think our coaches also appreciated that. And there's a great camaraderie within the staff um, Is there? and they support each other. And now that we have some 
some older coaches and some younger coaches that relationship those are really cool relationships that are developing and and that's uh, really good yeah so there's a lot of like like informal mentoring that are going on right now in the program so it's wow. it's great and so, dave wolf still there dave wolf is still there and won, it, won a legend. conference championship last year and, yeah and how and many it, is he 32 years or something I think it's it's in that range. I've lost, yeah. he and Smelly. I've lost count. Smelly's a, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah I, he might be in triple digits. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know where exactly. Smelly's. And what a you mentioned the name Russell Smelly to people. It's amazing. Yeah. The the what people just the respect he's earned over time. Oh, yeah. and The impact he's had and 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 Dave Wolf and John Moore and and of course uh, Coach Ruiz has just taken the baseball program now and lit it on fire. Yeah, that, um, I tell a lot of people that uh, Rob Ruiz, who was my first hire, um, made me look like- Was he like, really? Yeah, he made me look like, like a, a genius. genius. <laughs> because, right. you know, that you got program- got from Azusa, right? And, well, so that's the thing is, all I did to get him was I picked up the phone and said, Dad, I need a baseball coach. <laughs> and he said, I got a baseball coach for you. Is and that he, right? Because he was the associate head coach at Azusa. Oh, he wasn't the head coach. He was the associate head coach. Yeah, under Paul Sfagdis, who's still there. Oh, okay. Uh, but your dad knew about him. Uh, well, yeah, because he, yeah, he worked in, under my dad, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so my dad said, yeah, Robert's ready for a head coaching job. And uh, we had a full search, but he, you know, he nailed it. Yeah, and, he was the one. Yeah, he's the one. And, and, and he's, he's really progressed. Um, he's helping me with athletic administration. I really lean Is on he really? him. Uh, in the AD stuff, he handles a number of things that, given my roles, I, I can't get to. Right. Um, but he does it so well, and that's and great. Just so you started one for one in the head coaching <laughs> yeah. deal. Yeah, that's great. I also lit the baseball program on fire, literally. You did. Can I tell you a quick story? Okay. So we did this. We decided to go down to the baseball field at night, uh -huh. um, and douse baseballs in gasoline put them on the tee and then hit them. Okay. Seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Yes. <laughs> well, Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> right. So I was a freshman. Uh, again, freshman on the team, not a good player, no power at all fields, um, how, how I've described my hitting. So I, I am in charge of the gas can and somehow I got like way too close and the fire went this way. Uh oh. So we had like a, a big problem. Security arrives. We go bolting in like six different directions. I just remember jumping some fence like in the right field, down the right field line. So I lit the baseball program on fire also. Yeah. Like Robert. You did. Just in a different way. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Was, was, who was that was the coach? highlight of my baseball career was that Kirk night. Was Kirkgaard your coach? Kirkgaard was my coach. Okay. The great John Kirkgaard, who yeah. I'm still good friends with to He's this day. He's a great guy. Legendary, he, wonderful man. He's been so supportive of Robert. I Has think he? that that's that's had a huge impact on our program too. Oh, it's just great. the support that we still get from John. He's that's, so loved. And so is. I, when I was playing basketball at Westmont, all my buddies were baseball players who played for Kirkgaard. Oh, really? So I went to every baseball game. So I love John. Yeah, too, John so. Kirkgaard's a great guy. Yeah. Let's talk about John Moore. Okay. John Moore retired yeah. and, and he's, he's, he's finished as the head coach. And he's, he, my understanding is he's moving kind of into an associate athletic director. He may stick around right. in some capacity, but reflect on his career. And yeah. I know you guys have been friends a long time. And yeah. Reflect so, on that. So, so I, I actually grew up, I had seen John play high school. And, oh, really? Uh, at Los Alamitos. Because you're dead. Well, yeah, because we, Los Alamitos, where John played, is actually really close to Milliken. And so, oh, really? Yeah, so I had an occasion to see he and his, and his brother Mike play. Uh, in their years at Los Alamitos. Oh, nice. so, I didn't know um, that. And then, um, and then I watched John play at Westmont because uh, we used to go to the local Westmont games. And then okay. John coached at Fresno when I played for Chet Cameron oh, at really? Westmont. And so, yeah, a lot of years with John. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, I think there's a couple things that, I mean, there's so many things, but there's a couple things that really stand out to me about John is just, one, his, his relationship with the community. And mm -hmm. I don't mean just the Westmont community. For, for one, he's loved by the professors. Um, and he's a coach that just really embraced that 
faculty coach model mm. and uh, really I think uh, helped the athletic department and helped me as an AD in terms of credibility with the faculty because there's always a little bit of tension right. between right. athletics and the faculty right. and uh, John I think was instrumental in sort of bridging that Russell's another guy who fits in that category right. but um, so I, I would say that and then you know, some of the things that you know, really, I think West, Westmont stands where it does in this community in terms of the greater Santa Barbara community because of John's interaction with community. And um, I don't know if you follow the Santa Barbara Athletic yeah. Roundtable, yeah, yeah. but but John is, they always have John be the last guy to speak at that lunch during basketball season. And he goes every Monday and um, and he just represents the college so well right. in that environment. Yeah. And like the, the, you know, people just eat it up, but he also does a great job of sharing what's special about Westmont mm -hmm. to, to the greater Santa Barbara community. Right. And if I had to pick one thing that I just think, you know, will go beyond what he accomplished as a coach and what he accomplished with certain players and so forth, it would be that he he really did um, sort of help Westmont. I mean, when you think about it, he's he outlived a lot of presidents at Westmont, right? And so his right. name and face in the community um, was the Westmont coach. Yeah. And right. so, what a great ambassador he was for all these years yes. in that regard. So true. Yeah. So true. We he was he was here a few weeks ago. We had a great time talking reflecting and talking about i loved that episode oh, because i loved when you threw out names and he was right, like right, coming right. up the with each right, one right, that right. was good that well was good. and then the jeff a's i mean he almost brought me to tears i mean i'm just talking about a's but 26 years together yeah and just that story that's just such a powerful story of uh you know on azen's part of kind of just servant yeah servant's heart yeah. And just the way that they, you know, love each other. It's yeah. powerful. Yeah. Well, so that's all on the Westmont athletic director side. I want to talk about your, your, your career. I want to talk about, well, let's start with Medbridge. Okay. And um, w when I was, you know, here years and years ago, it was, it was, it was always Dave Odell was associated with the Tynan group. Mm -hmm. That was the name in my head. And yeah. Now it's Medbridge. But tell us, I, I read a little bit about Medbridge, but for somebody who's watching, what, what does Medbridge do? Right. So, so what we do is we partner with um, surgeons, uh, physicians that, that specialize in surgery, and we develop and then part, partner with and develop and manage outpatient surgery centers. So, oh. um, so imagine a doctor, you know, needing to do your ACL reconstruction because you blew out your knee playing basketball. Um, most of my centers are, are orthopedic in nature. So my partners are mostly orthopedic surgeons. You've probably heard of Dr. Ryu right. locally, yep. um, is a well-known surgeon. Yep. So I did my first surgery center in Santa Barbara at uh, called Summit Surgery Center right across the street from the hospital. And we, we did it because um, the doctors wanted to specialize their surgical environment. And instead of going to the hospital where You've got all different kinds of specialties going on, and you might be doing a, you know, a hernia repair at eight o'clock, and at nine o'clock an ACL, and at ten o'clock some heart procedure. Right. They wanted to be able to specialize, huh. and they wanted to be able to buy the highest tech equipment. They wanted their staff in the operating room, the tech, the circulating nurses, to be specialized in what they did. So it was at the time. This was you know, late 90s, there were only 400 surgery centers in America, and now they're 5,000. Is that right? And, um, and in fact, um, Medicare has really leaned on the surgery center industry to, to reduce the costs in the Medicare system. Oh. So, um, in fact, over the last couple of years, we're now doing uh, total joints in an outpatient setting um, for Medicare patients. Wow. And, uh, and we've We've played an instrumental role during the pandemic because, you know, surgeries haven't been able to get done in the hospital because they've been saving oh, right. beds. Right. So COVID. we've actually been taking on more cases at the surgery center. Wow. Um, and so, so my, my company, Medbridge, we, we put together the doctors who partner together. 
we develop the surgery centers and then we hire the staff and we manage it. So we do all the business function, all the billing and the collections and all the Medicare certification, all the state and federal guidelines following. And then the surgeons just do schedule surgery. their cases and they do their surgery. And wow. um, from a business model standpoint, we get a facility fee, just like the hospital would get a fee. Yep. And it's an opportunity for the doctors to make a little more money because they're partners in the entity. So they- the doctors who work there are partners in the business. Exactly. That is the surgery center. Exactly. So instead wow. of just making their professional fee, right. they get a little cut of the profit of the surgery center. Wow. Um, and so it, um, it's really interesting because as reimbursements have dropped, meaning doctors are getting paid less now yep. than they ever have, yep. um, they are really relying on these ancillary revenues like, like outpatient surgery. So wow. um, anyways, the other cool thing about it is, Dr. Ryu is a great example. He used to say, you know, I would get done with my operative day at eight o'clock and be happy if I got home to see my kids because of the backups that happen in a hospital with triage cases that need to get put on. And once we opened the surgery center, he was done by two every day. And wow. it allowed him to have a little more balance in his life, you know, yeah. Uh, and wow. all that. So um, interesting. So that's the business. Um, we have 15 different surgery centers that we are partners in or provide services to across California. Um, and they're but they're not called MedBridge. The, they're the they're centers. all named separate entities. Okay. They all have different ownerships. We're the we're the sort of the operating group. I see. And we're owners in most of them. And so uh, yeah, it's a it's an interesting business and and uh, one that. I sort of stumbled into. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you, how, how did that happen? Well, so I'm a CPA by trade, right. uh, so I had gone that route, and you know about switching careers. <laughs> I, I do. You know, uh, I did love it, um, and uh, John Tynan, my current partner, uh, asked me to come help him with Tynan Group, which he had just started. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we did was we bought a building by, by the hospital just as an investment, and it happened to be occupied by a number of orthopedic surgeons. And oh. they, so I was their landlord. And they came and they said, we'd love for you to build us a surgery center. And I said, what's that? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and they explained it to me. I said, okay, let's try it. And so I did one and I thought, okay, we'll just go back to our knitting. And, and, uh, yeah. and then about a year and a half later, I got a call from a very prominent Bay Area surgeon named Eugene Wolf. Um, who actually was probably the first, uh, the, the, he's sort of known for a particular knee and shoulder procedure, um, asked me to develop his surgery center, and then it kind of just snowballed from wow. there. Wow, and you have 15 now. Yeah, yeah. And they're all in California? They're all in California. We have one um, that we're working on out of state um, right now, but, but really focused on California, just because I, I never wanted to have to take two planes to get anywhere. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> so we have a Bay Area presence, but pretty much everything is down here. Yeah, we have yeah. three in the surgery. In the, in that the is really interesting. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about culture, uh -huh. just in companies and anywhere. Yeah. What's the, what have you learned? You've been in business a long time. You've been an athletic director a long time now. Um, what have you learned about culture in a workplace in a, that is important to you? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and that, I think, um, what, what uh, employees um, expect from a culture, from a company, is very different today than it even was five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we're constantly sort of evolving mm -hmm. as it relates to culture. Um, I think that one thing that is for sure, and, and I think long-term wise, is I've tried to build um, culture around service. Mm -hmm. Everything I, that I've been involved with professionally has been about making the people that we serve better and able to focus on their trade, whether it be Dr. Marcus Elliott at P3, mm -hmm. um, helping him be able to spend more time in the science of sports, mm -hmm. helping uh, Dr. Ryu be able to spend more time in surgery where mm -hmm. he really is helping patients versus administrative right. things. Whether it, it's keeping my coaches 
with their athletes right. and on the floor coaching them versus having to do other administrative tasks that you know so so I've sort of built the focus of my cultures around service yeah. and um, but I think that the, the 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 big thing that needs to happen in culture whether it be an athletic program or a business is creating um, meaning around what what mission is and what what each person that shows up how what they're doing helps others changes the world changes their community mm -hmm. it gives them something more than am i just doing this for a paycheck right or if i just doing this for another trophy um right. more around like what are, what am i doing for humanity or yeah. the kingdom or you right. know, what have you Dave, thanks for coming by. I'm sure we'll have you on again thanks, uh, sometime down the road. This but has been great. Great talking with you. Good and we'll see you next time. We want to invite you to our website, www.goodlifetelevision.org. All of the episodes, uh, the full form interviews, are on goodlifetelevision.org. And one other thing, we're always looking for great stories, great people. Uh, they don't have to be famous. In fact, most of them that come on Good Life aren't famous. But we love great stories of overcoming, of persevering, of entrepreneurial uh, creativity, of young people doing great things, of uh, people who are peacemakers in our community. So if you know of one, make sure you let us know about it. We'd love to have them on the program. So goodlifetelevision.org, and if you know of somebody with a great story, send them our way. We'll see you real soon.